um, some of the the ways that you've described this work to me as being um, as dealing with kind of a world building impulse that um, you said have said is linked fundamentally with decomposition. So I wanted to maybe start by talking about those two impulses in this work, the the world building and then how, how that's linked for you to decay. Um, I guess one, one early example or just a sort of little um, moment of if not inspiration, just drive for like, yes, yes, that's right, is um, I was listening to Zadie Smith and she said the way that un the way that her novels get built, which was an interesting way to say it, instead of written, the way that her, novel her novels get built is that she builds a scaffolding, but then she kind of warns the audience that at it's crucial that you take the scaffolding down as you go. Um, because if you clearly leave the structure that supplies building, then you don't ever reveal the, the facade of the building itself. Um, but then she goes on to elaborate about the, the actual labor of the, and architecture of the scaffolding and how that becomes the novel, essentially. Um, so I think a lot of the work that we are um, consistently returning to is the the problems and the discourse and the um, desire of um, building up and at the same time kind of taking down as we go, if not for each other, also communally or um, in a shared effort to build and deconstruct, but um, Mostly the way that we're working is one person is busy with something and the other person kind of either in a playful or mischievous way will start to pull down what the other is constructing to really speak to this temporality and this, um, yeah, the, the kind of dystopic nature of world building, which is that things don't last. And maybe also the dystopia of caring so while something is being built or, or a certain attention is being given to something, um, there are other elements in the room that are being lost or masked or marginalized in some way. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe then you could say a little bit just about how the, what you were doing when people were entering tonight is related to the, the longer work that you've been doing? Well, the, I mean, it's, it's definitely related, um, but the, the piece that we're making is a room in itself, so it can't, it's not simply dance that can happen anywhere. Um, but we're doing it anyway. But we're doing it a lot of places. <laughs> It's New York City. You do it, you get it where you can. Um, but yeah, we have a large, um, a large brick wall that gets built, um, not during the piece, but there's in the middle of this industrial-esque room, there's a large gray uh, wall that stands as a sculpture and it has a lot of um, fixtures in it that you saw us try to do here tonight. <laughs> Um, it has fixtures that run the gamut of looking a bit um, dungeon-esque, like the cuffs that you see, the black leather cuffs, and the, you know, the um, nice under things that we wear, um, to more industrial hooks and rods, uh, coat racks, brackets, um, hardware type things that are kind of misused in this way. They get they get a bit sexualized or in, uh, treated in the way that the cuffs immediately speak to, and then also the cuffs get used in a more utilitarian, um, hardware-esque way that the, that the other fixtures lend to. Um, and then other, th other things emerge also, but this wall is a major part of the room. There's also two live musicians who are um, also generating sound. We refer to them as the sound body. They work together 
to create sound that is um, participating in, the, if not the same level, if a more bombastic level than the rest of the materials in the room. Um, so really not a soundtrack for a performance, but actually an active participant in the room. Um, then we have all these, these are some of the materials we're working with. Um, but yeah, the, what you saw was a practice that can be done in an office type environment. <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful lofted office type environment. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, I guess maybe we could talk a bit about the selection of objects then um, and the relationship between the, the natural and the non-natural in that collection. Um, in the sort of a Vanitas style of painting, I wish we actually had one to show, but you can probably picture what it's like. Um, there's the, there is this combination of man-made and, and natural things that kind of reinforces the perishability of the natural world while also kind of rendering these objects into commodities by being painted in this way as, as part of a still life. So I wanted to see if you could talk a bit about the significance between living things or like dead things and then man-made things in, in, the, in the collection of objects. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about that. I mean, the, I guess the most obvious thing is the bones, which are supposedly dead material or at least past a certain lifespan. But it's kind of incredible how much, um, how living they are supposed to be when you try and get them into customs, <laughs> like through customs. Like there's a hell of a lot of treatment that they have to go through in order to be, to be considered man-made, yeah. Um, um, yeah, and uh, I, I don't know. I think we didn't really approach uh, the, the gathering and the, the sourcing the materials as um, through um, a kind of desire to find, you know, a representation, allegorical or even symbolic value. Um, it was really more a kind of intuitive sense and a desire to have, um, you know, things that maybe don't necessarily have a utilitarian uh, or an obvious utilitarian uh, thingness about them. They can be many things. And I think uh, also alongside that, there was, an, there was this desire to have um, materials that had different rates of decay or perishability. Um, we kind of joke that, you know, the, the performance is something in, betwe in between a construction site and a cooking show. And, and so the ingredients are kind of spectruming um, that absurd range. <laughs> but there also seems to be this um, desire to approach, to kind of defamiliarize or like misuse objects or... Um, maybe approach them so in some way that you don't know quite what it, what it is when you get there or something? Can you, and, and that's so sort of a performative tactic, can you talk a bit about that? Like you're not using a chair as a chair most of the time. Yeah, it came up. It came up in the studio the other day. We were talking about proper use and improper use, uh, in like directly in relationship to the materials. And I realized, like, actually, I don't know what the proper use of a fur is, or um, I mean, apart Other than from draping it over your chair from CB2. V voila, yeah. <laughs> or like, or even a lime. Like, I don't know any other use for a lime except in a cocktail. Really, I mean, <laughs> so I think it's also about like, th I think these materials are in a sense ambiguous of their own accord and also loaded and heavy. Um, that, so they at, the, at, they, at the same time, they escape meaning and, and, and are in place of meaning. Nope, nope, didn't happen. Um, well, to me it seems sort of like your kind of 
uncovering like sort of layers of meaning in, in like the natural or what's meant by that, which I know is something that you've worked on before in your last piece. And I think Simone, you've also worked with sort of creating a like artificial nature using some kind of work with nature and artificiality and, and that relationship, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, that's interesting to me because I, I did notice too that there's like this, there are these amb ambiguous materials, those um, like, what's it called? Not PVC. Was it, was it like those rubbery sheets that you were working with just now? Latex. Latex. That they, that it looked, it's like the most unnatural material, but it looks very natural. Like when you're sort of draping it on your body, it has that kind of quality, um, which is actually kind of like, and latex as a material and just kind of this boundary between the very unnatural that becomes part of the body is like a very sexual thing. Like that is kind of like sensuality in a way. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about the, cause you, you talk, spoke about it for a second before, but just kind of sort of what, the kind of sensual aspect of what you're doing and maybe sort of how, how you're working with power in, in there as well, something that came up for me. I don't know, I feel like for me that, I mean a lot of the kind of scores or a few of the scores that we work with have to do with domesticity in some sense um, because there is so much work around um, taking care of all the elements in the room and there is this, I don't know, general feeling of like how can we, how can we make things fit even if we know that that is a utopia that, you know, and that things maybe won't fit. Um, it feels like uh, in that sort of domestic everydayness, this ordinariness of, you know, folding, attaching, fixing, um, that there are there are ways in which that can open up to produce or, or stimulate in that sort of rubbing, fixing, uh, intimacy, or or even uh, eroticism. I don't really know how that happens, <laughs> but it seems it seems to take place in the studio. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a. I'm anyway. I have desires with material and people that often align themselves, even though I know this is a fur and that's a, a human, but I. My desire is for something other than a kind of um, set um, thermometer about uh, on how I'm able to relate and exist and f feel time and time again. So I think m in general, this intimate or sensual approach is the way in which in world building scenarios we we uncover newness. Like we actually uncover new ways of being through power, sex, money. I mean, these are the exchanges that we participate in. Um, and we do it through material all the time. This is just different because it's a performance, so it's, it, it feels isolated from anything else. But actually the exchange of fabric between people that deals with commodity. Um, uh, these thing, these are intimate gestures. The women on Canal Street whispering, "If you want a purse, like this is not. Hey, would you like to buy a purse from me?" There's like a, there's a back room relationship to the economy there. You know, uh, maybe I'm going a little bit off tangent, but I just feel like this this thing about um, this intimate sensuality or this intimate sensual approach to things is actually my understanding for how we, um, for how we become curious about things. That's why people get closer and start rubbing. <laughs> you know, that's why sex happens, that's why certain things happen, is because that's the way that we start to become curious and also at the same time opening up uh, engagements of proximity and understanding and meaning and misuse and um, 
I don't know, this feels like the most essential thing to me, not particular to performance. Yeah, but it strikes me also that, that it's maybe partly a product of how internal the performance is, that you're not really producing an external performance, that you're very focused on each other or yourself. And so as a viewer, you're... I rubbed someone's neck with I'm grapefruit. sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's a, you're, not a, you're not really in like a display mode. Yeah. You're in kind of like an internal discovery mode where you're doing things yeah. not really to be watched, seemingly. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about mm -hmm. that um, and, and kind of how you relate to the people who are in the room mm -hmm. and that kind of um, producing that really internal kind of sensual discovery uh, with people watching. I mean, I think that might be where it's a little bit different from like the practice that can happen in this room versus the performance, because the performance is very geared toward being looked at, um, and a lot of performative cheeky things are happening. Um, but I think, yeah, for this moment of a group of people huddled around the center and two dancer type people half naked on the floor. Yeah, we go into the material and into each other as a kind of stabilizing thing. But I do think also there's an interest in messing with that dynamic of like this, like that actually, maybe this is crass to say, but that that intimacy actually is meant to be watched. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I mean, we're dealing with, uh, or we're constantly dealing with shame, so I think to be watched while, you know, rubbing lime on somebody is another element of, I mean, maybe it's, maybe someone won't want to watch it, but it's not to not be watched. Um, just like, rigging something, we're kind of treating, that's why we talk about this, this spectrum of cooking show and construction site, because rigging something up high, having to get on a ladder, in he, you know, like this kind of labor, coupled with this more intimate gesture is the spectrum that we're interested in. It feels like there's a whole range of things that, that need to be done, and, you know, and that ranges from like, you know, bathing, eating, um, lifting this up, fixing the light bulb, um, and then a kind of curiosity that might might emerge from that, like you know, someone's fixing the light bulb, someone's telling a joke, giving you a sandwich, and you've got some like weird alchemy that happens that produces something else, that might be erotic, that might be humor, that might be some other kind of emotion. So I think it's you know a, a rubbing up of these things together that allows something else to happen. Um, and I mean, likewise, I don't, I don't feel like um, that there's anything that shouldn't be watched. That I feel like there's a kind of deviancy which is part of um, the social world we live in and it's, and it's a vital part and I feel like um, Maybe you do it behind closed doors, or maybe you do it, you know, with the window, the door half ajar, or maybe you just do it in performance. But I mean, I <laughs> think it's people welcome it or invite it on different levels. And also, that, not to take us too far back, but I think that alchemy speaks to the collection of materials. Just to go deeper into the research that we were doing, it wasn't like, okay, we're deeply interested in decay, how can we talk about that? It was this collection and almost like this eagerness to be around things, and we were like, okay, we're gonna need to make a potion. So what do you need for a potion? You need things that smell, uh, okay, we get pines, you know? If you light the pines, we didn't, don't do it here, but if you light the pine, it starts to waft in the room. If you peel a grapefruit, you can smell it at a distance. We can taste the cinnamon in our mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that's the sort of intuitive collection of things that, that I think, maybe I win points here for connecting it to Vanitas, but I just, 
I don't think that this is like some genius, like, aha, this is how we will talk about time passing and decay and, um, and gluttony and, and these things that come up with it, but I think it's like based on context and desire and things that are happening, there's a collection of things. Um, and then the frame really helps participate in its own narrative. Um, but I mean, bones, like a skull in the painting, the bones here, something draped off the table, something more delicate, a small chain or a little thimble that you use for sewing. Like these things, these are all sort of like daily goods. And I think we've always been obsessed with the arrangement and absurdity of positioning things that seem like they don't belong together or but yeah. I think these things also speak to um, a certain history, like they contain a certain knowledge, a lot of the materials, um, and have like been enacted in, in various scenarios historically or in various ways. But we also carry that history. And like when I think back, like how the bones arrived, and it just feels oddly... Um, yeah, uh, like a, an odd coincidence that I've, I've, I'm like a previous work, I had been working in a skeleton costume, I had been working with, you know, fruit, and also kind of working with this vanita still life imagery, but in a, in a, almost in a weird kind of reversal, like how, not the, not the sort of mor mor uh, morality issue around, um, you know, be careful of the, you know, pleasures of the earthly pleasures because life is um, You can't take it with you. Sorry? You can't take it with you. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on where you go. Yeah. <laughs> but rather like from, from the other perspective, like if there's no body uh, through which to express those desires, like how does death deal with the frustration of not being able to um, experience those pleasures? Yeah, it sounds weird. You've got to see the show. <laughs> no, I think, I mean... We're currently there's looking for a gig in New York City. Yeah, right. <laughs> there's kind of this, uh, the interrelatedness of all of these objects, right, that they speak somehow together as a collection. And I, I know that it's important to you that this notion of arrangement and what arranging produces as a kind of structure or process... Um, or notion of progress as kind of an arrangement. And maybe you could talk a bit about that, about how you're putting the objects together in, in collections and arranging them. I mean, just, just recently in the past few days, it's come up like the use, uh, not the use, the, I mean, we have, we, we're making a piece, yeah, so we're trying to be particular about um, moving through different ideas and a kind of dramaturgy, but then there are all these same things in the room all the time, including the two of us. So how to approach these things with a kind of newness, but also return to this thing that is making performance, which it's, re it's essentially returning to things, even if it's not set choreography or designed in some, some way that is exact every uh, or exactly the same every time, but there's a return. Um, so maybe that speaks to the collection. We, I don't. We definitely don't talk about collection, but it, that word doesn't upset me so much. But we, um, uh, yeah, it's different things. Like when we're talking about a a kind of domesticity or a, or this like domestic score that we enter. Just today, Simone said, what is it about that? And there, it feels to be that there's something about this in its, like I could spread this out and show, the, and not, sh not even necessarily show, but be concerned with the fine detail of the end. Whereas in another more, like if I'm trying to rig something, I might be focused on the thing I'm trying to rig and get this under my arm so I can climb the ladder. So the, the delicacy of this is lost. And it could be any, it could be the, the sweater, it could be the chain, like the 
so, so it's the treatment and the care for each thing. Likewise to Simone's body. I mean, I think that it, it's the same. I can treat her in a, in a delicate way. I can also rig her up to connect her to the chair, and it's the chair that I want to hang, but she gets wound up in the wire, you know? So I guess that's how I register the collection of things. Um, yeah, I guess when I said collection, I meant... There's this, there's this kind of paradox between attention to detail and irreverence, which is happening. Like, I'll, 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 you know, I'll utilize this thing because it's necessary now for a certain desire, which is overwhelming and feels like it needs to be taken care of. And at the same time, I might be completely distracted by the detail on the, you know. Yeah, I guess, I guess when I said collection, I meant sort of like this, uh, this care to everything, that like what's in the room is what's in the room, and everything has to be kind of accounted for and uh, treated equally or, or something, or like encountered. Um, but maybe I'm wondering how you approach each other in this work and kind of like whether you're trying to treat each other like objects or I mean it seems to me like you're trying to kind of uh, push back against the opposition of like a body and an object and kind of come up with a separate way of approaching things. Can you maybe say a bit more about that, about how you, how you are together in the performance? I mean, we definitely talk about everything as material. And we don't talk, uh, not in a like really strict way, like don't say object, but it, we, the bones are material, Simone is material, I'm, my hair becomes material, you know? So it's like my hair all of a sudden is a p not a part of me if it gets caught and she's put, rigging it to something. That's not me that's getting rigged. It's actually this thing, which is an extension of me, but then, so then why wouldn't the fur be an extension of me if I'm wearing it? Um, like I'm wearing this, you know? So I think, um, yeah, in speaking about material, then we're also speaking about live sound. We're also speaking about the bodies in the room, the little fixture details on the wall, the big wall that we have in our piece. Um, the walls surrounding the wall that's in the, yeah. So we're, we're really talking about materiality um, and the problem of that thing, all things are not equal. Um, and I don't think we are inside of a participation that they are, but there is, but, think, but all things are also shifting all the time. I mean, that is a shawl and it's also something to wipe the floor with if you spill the grapefruit juice and the office doesn't want you to spill the grapefruit. You know, there's this, it's not just that this becomes 18 different things, but actually its materiality has potential, like the body. Like, that's why I'm interested in performance. Yeah, well, it, it seems like the, the value of a... Um, piece of fur being able to be multiple things is that it kind of speaks to the like unmaking and remaking of certain social relations that I know is is part of how you're kind of thinking about this work. Um, maybe we could talk a bit about some of the like political writing that you've looked at, which is kind of a, in my opinion, a bit of a strange piece of political writing. Like it's this this writing by this uh, like Russian socialist feminist who's writing, um, and the, 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 the work that you sent me in particular is this kind of bizarre, like a manifesto um, against prostitution, but because it's like not useful, like not because it's like bad for women necessarily, but because like their labor is like better uh, used for other things. Um, so I don't know, maybe you could talk a little bit about this, wh what made you interested in reading her work and kind of like the, the ways that like a political manifesto was like useful to you in this work? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, part of this 
we had actually made a couple of decisions beforehand that Jen and I were going to work together um, on a project that was, you know, coming out of a lot of um, affinities we shared about ways of making work and the way we thought about work. Um, and at a, you know, same time, there was a, a theatre in Berlin who were preparing this festival with a art institution um, around the Russian Revolution and a festival that they wanted to do collaboratively called Utopian Realities. And for that, they suggested um, the writings of Alexandra Kolontai as a starting point, um, which we started to read. And, um, and I guess quite simultaneously, we were in the studio working um, so that was kind of feeding into each other. And there was one particular text that she was, um, yeah, something of a, a manifesto um, where she was uh, describing what she would imagine um, a reorganization or restructuring of a family would look like um, through the lens of a communist I ideology. <clears throat> but one of the things she mentions there that we found quite problematic was that in order to do this, there would need to be an eradication of prostitution, which um, she, fe she felt even harked back to the sort of marriage contract. Like if women were not working um, and therefore reliant on the male on an, on an economic level, they were already somehow in the realm of prostitution. And she wanted to rid society of this evil, actually, is what she described. But in doing so, she, she did this kind of poetic thing of like, don't worry, there'll still be the mother and there'll still be uh, the family, there'll still be children, only, you know, certain things will change and, you know, the, fam the, the state will look after the children. So you, her idea, I guess, was a bit like, you'll still be able to perform motherhood, but the total onus won't be on you. And so this led us to think about uh, architectures for the family, or, or, or architectures for living in. And, and so we got busy with a kind of, um, yeah, kind of text around, um, that, that almost, in a poetic way, tries to rethink uh, architecture. Like, the, you know, that maybe there's a window, but you probably don't see it, see through it in quite the same angle. Um, there'll be walls, but they may not support the roof. Um, so I guess this is how we entered into the realm of, of what we have now with, you know, the wall, the chair, the ladder, and this potential to sort of scaffold these normative roles and and somehow queer them or make them alternative or figure them out or reorganize them differently i think yeah we both we both stopped at the this text that was calling for the eradication of prostitution it was a big problem and we were like m maybe this isn't the right thing for us to do i mean if this is the if this is the feminist text that we're supposed to be supporting. It didn't seem right for either of us. But it was quickly like an interesting, I think we're both interested in, in the polemic of thing. The, you know, we're both interested actually in working inside of the problem, or at least the space that feels too tight that we have to chisel a bit. Um, but yeah, the sort of intuitive, quick logic that spun from this eradication of prostitution was like, well, wait, this has been happening forever. It's not just this one woman who's calling for this, like the, the witch trials are this. Um, this overabundant uh, energy that's allocated often to the female body, um, saying like, move over to the side or quiet down or stay at home or do these things is a yeah it's happening it's not it's not so crazy um but there was an interesting uh bit in there that, where prostitution is so closely linked to the exchange of money um 
that I think that became super interesting to, to start to think about in terms of researching performance. Um, yeah. yeah, well, she sort of like seems to consider prostitution to be kind of this like deforming force like to society. And obviously you're sort of pushing back against that as being obvious or something. But I wonder how that links to your notion of decomposition in some way. That I think it seems like there was something attractive to you about her position in the sense that she was basically speaking in the wake of a successful revolution and then there was kind of like now what like now what now what are our problems or like what do we do when like all of our problems have like supposedly been solved um so i'm wondering how you kind of see that those issues like the sort of the problem the like decay of civilization and sort of how you're thinking about decomposition and world building I mean, we quickly from that text started looking into other manifestos, Dada manifestos, um, and it just really, on a very fast level, became clear that this, this statement about how things need to be in order to progress in society is a problem. The second you say this is the manifesto, this is how we proceed, you eliminate everything else in the world. So all of the immediate research we did was, well, how could we, A, not write our own manifesto, not perform a utopic manifesto, which already, without even having to go into it, is starting to, like, failure, we just talked about this today, failures in the room were not devising a queer performance that elevates failure, it just is existing, which speaks to decay. <laughs> um, so that's not like an active participant. I think it's just a, a shared, it's a shared belief. Um, but so from not writing these manifestos and, and trying to consider wanting to move forward in the world and wanting to engage in certain things, like things that might look like family structure, things that might look like sex, things that might look like bathing, things that might look like feeding, things that I want to do, I want to eat daily, have sex daily, go to bed daily. Like there are things that I want to participate in, but if they're just fixed this way, what does it look like? So if there's a chair in between us and I can just feed her from the side, you know? Um, so I think, I don't, I don't know it's like if it's hitting the head of the nail on decay, but I think just that that obsession with fixing things is starting to, there's a rubbing there that's like taking the paint off the wall. You know, it's a little bit like scraping at the facade of the thing. Yeah, or, or sort of like this notion of like, that getting things right requires like every, like, or like political consciousness requires like individual effort or something like that. That like each, that there's, um, you know, you don't just say your manifesto once and then it's finished, so you have to, there's sort of this performative dimension to, to a manifesto or to political awareness in that it's uh, individual and collective and repeated in this way that I think is something maybe you're picking up on as performers. Um, I guess I was wondering also how you think, maybe this isn't something you think about, but like, I know in, in Vanitas there's this kind of emphasis on technical mastery and um, kind of a, a triumph over death in a way just by kind of rendering things so perfectly. Um, and I wonder if that's something you think ab about really, at, you know, in working in the field of dance kind of this work or mastery of some kind or wh whether you're working like against those notions or whether they enter into the way you're scoring this at all. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we're working towards conventional ideas of mastery well, or, sure. or I virtuosity. Mean, yeah. um, but is there, is there like a but notion of the, mastery that's, that you're I working think, on? Yeah, I think in the, the complicatedness and the juggling of, of handling all of those, um, well, this, this complex ecology, like how to, how to sustain um, all elements in the room. Um, 
Yeah, there's a kind of there's a there's a there's a commitment. <laughs> there's a real commitment to it, which um, it's not. I have to say, it's not easy. I, know. I think that's why I cried in the cab on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we have we have very particular scores that shift and you know and if you're not inside of the thing that feels like machine you're not doing it i mean anyone who's making performance is that particular it's like i'm not just expressing myself for an hour and 25 minutes while people watch me i'm working on shit and if it doesn't come out particular then it feels like it's not i haven't gotten to the work yet um, so it's not technical mastery in terms of the dance, the the old dance field of whatever, but pointing and flexing. But yeah, it is like if if I am not really rubbing aggressively enough, then we're not inside of the score that we said we were. Or if I'm not tasting anything, then I haven't gotten to the witchy part of making the potion. You know. So then it, it's very easy that you can just get lost inside of the abundance of everything. Um, yeah, it seems very demanding performatively um, to me, like really hard. Um, I guess I wanted, I don't know, if, I wonder if, like, do you have, are there pitfalls that you encounter when you perform this piece? Like, are there things that, um, like, I guess I wonder if you're kind of trying to avoid, like, plot making or, like, archetypes or, like, is there a set of behaviors and kind of directions that you, because it seems to me that it's actually pretty hard to misrecognize something over and over again that you would start to make sense of things. And like, if you're actively working against doing that, that's quite complicated. And like, if you could talk a little bit about like what the kind of things you're working against are performatively in that way. I just, to speak a little bit from the experience of the last two weeks, I feel like there's a, there's a frustration in having touched everything a number of times and a, nu and a number of constellations and there's this feeling of like, ciao. Hi. <laughs> there's this feeling of like, oh, build another I assemblage of things, uh, like bring a certain you know, number of uh, materials in proximity to see if it speaks differently or brings a, a sense of newness or whatever. And that's, that's hard to do after um, weeks of practice. I kind of lost your question there. I was asking kind of about like the, if there are pitfalls or uh, like yeah, if uh, you're oh, and, working and against. And genres or, or character types. Yeah, or yeah, like, cause, cause, cause it, it's very suggestive of like archetypes yeah. and, mm. and character and things mm. like that. Mm. But obviously it's, you're working a, a very much against those things. It seems to me. I'm, let it, I'm interested in letting them slip a little, mm. but n I wonder then, yeah, what's, like today, we were, we're working with Joshua Lubin Levy. He's doing a little bit of dramaturgy for us. And he said, Oh, you were the Russian prince. I had this wrapped around my head, and I was sitting on the stool, not in a way that I normally sit, I guess, like a little bit performative. And he said, Okay, that's the moment where you were the Russian princess. Like trying to make some logic around, he knows we're doing the research on the Russian Revolution. But it's actually quite true. I mean, I was participating in some sort of distance. I don't even know where that might come from, that idea of like, okay, if I can just get the fur, I'll be the Russian woman. You know, it's. It's, not it's even representation, though. It's like some kind of embodiment that you're like. I'm not even embodiment. It's like a. Yeah, I don't, it's, a I just, I it's don't another. Know. I mean, we're s if things are flashing through image and memory and representation all the time, I think representation is also as flimsy as the experiential. I mean, you can only hold on to representation for so long. That's why marriage 
as an institution is like not sustaining for the whole world. I mean, you can only hold on to this still life for so long before the paint starts to chip away, or you have to have a good art handler, or you have to keep it behind glass. Like, things are not staying, you know? They're not holding over time. Representation also being one of those things. So I think m we can more like slide through these things. Um, it also doesn't mean anything. Like I wouldn't know what that would mean that I, in one moment I would represent a Russian princess and in the next moment we could be in a sort of S&M entanglement. Like I, I can't quite put a story together based on those two images. Right. <laughs> um, Look. Well, you could try. Um, well, maybe we should just um, open it up a bit, and if anyone has questions or anything they want to say, we can talk for maybe five more minutes or something like that. Um, I will relinquish my microphone now. Um, how do you think about objectives, like in the kind of local and long term? Like, there's, you said that uh, you take interest in things and. Um, and you're working at things. Uh, can you talk about choices in terms of you know, what gets you interested and in, and in how you kind of come to something that you're going to work on? I mean, I th I think I become quickly interested in um, a rearranged posture of of what I can kind of taste as um, beauty maybe that that seems like on a really simple level what I would gravitate toward like um, hmm, how do I want to say beauty or I guess the thing the entanglements that I find myself in would be having a leather around my face and trying to eat the grapefruit you know just like layers around um, I mean, Simone says often this phrase, the, the nearness of erotics. Like, it doesn't quite mean, like, erotic in front of your face, but that there's a, there's like a distant hint of it, you know, where there's, I don't really think about the, the leather as an obstacle or, um, but it does rearrange the first thought, notion of beauty or desire or, um, I guess I get, I mean, I'm not a performer um, or an artist who's like going for the most extreme um, arrangement of things or the most extreme state or, but I am drawn to a loss of control when it's um, situated within a, like a, a very focused brewing of, intuitive things that have, that have come together over time. Um, and that the pot might boil over, um, especially in a, in a physical sense. Um, this I'm drawn to, but it's not something I would reach towards immediately. I'd have to like lay the, lay the ground for it or the, yeah, fertilize it somehow. There's one more question. Yeah, I saw a hand back there too. Thank you guys both uh, so much uh, for inhabiting two roles tonight, answering questions and talking about the work and also being in the work. And um, I thought you had a very interesting transition between the two, which was sort of uh, what I've seen, Jen, in a few of your pieces before, this kind of, uh, but it was very different this time, the kind of gathering of all the materials after they've kind of been maybe if this is a little violent, but defamiliarized and then kind of drawn into like various scenarios and then there's a real mess and then it has to kind of be brought back together so it can happen tomorrow after you've slept or whatever. Um, but they've been kind of brought back together and then you immediately started taking down the chairs in this kind of way where, and also I noticed like you were talking about you have a specific built room, but in this performance what seemed to be preoccupying you was kind of, um, we don't have that room, and so how do we make that the kind of primary material of this performance? Like it's, it's like we're, we, have, we are 
in diaspora. We're somewhere where it wasn't, where these ideas did not come from. And now we're kind of here in Triple Canopy and we have to tie stuff to various places. So I guess um, uh, that transition between kind of like a, a more theatrical mode um, with a kind of, um, without uh, the kind of uh, stage and the backdrop and the curtain, um, but also s maintaining that somehow, constantly um, inviting us in, in, the, in a, into the, what you said was internal or something like that, as still theatrical and acted, um, but also inhabited. So I guess I just wanted to ask about that gathering together, how in this kind of instance, how you were thinking about that um, and the divide between, uh, or how you feel about being the performer and uh, talking about it uh, conceptually, just following in that way. It, it's just a way to go from doing a practice into a talk. I mean, we, we were like, who's gonna set up the chairs? I'll set up the cha I'll st start setting up the chairs and then you, but it is in line with, I think, something that we're both interested in, which is like, who, who's gonna clean up after this is, oh, I guess I will, you know? Again. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it feels like shared, um, uh, neuroses and also just labor. It's got to get done, you know. Um, but I don't know that 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 wasn't such a. Di we didn't talk about doing that. Well, we didn't talk about like clearing anything before we would set up the chairs. It just feels like you sh should clean up a little bit before you have your guests sit down. Um, yeah, it feels like a super basic thing that also is like probably a deeply shared moral around crafting spaces uh, and being together with other people. It's like I would clearly clean up for you if you're gonna come over. Um, yeah, we also just talk a lot about in the room that we work in. We talk about like, we're not looking for this performative disaster, like, oh fuck, the performers just did this in dur durational piece for an hour and a half and now it's a mess. And how cool is that? Yeah. Like we're not so invested in that, that kind of like performance art poke that's like, I can twist this and turn this and rip it and tear it. It's actually like, I can do that, but then I have to really think about the care again, which is like, this is a delicate piece of fur. Somebody should clean it up after we, what we did to it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I feel very tired of the kind of performances where, you know, you have a proposal, a sort of plateau, stuff happens, and then we get to look at the aftermath. I just feel like, no, what is it to return, to come back the next day, to, like, rework the materials again and reorganize them? And I'm more interested in this than the kind of disaster zone, even if there was chaos in between. Um, I think this attention to care within is, is, yeah, really what makes me curious, actually. There's time for maybe one more question. That's a good place to end, end it with care. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.